Coco yourself. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Just got notification that the Animal Behavior Center went live. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, here's where we, this Coffee with the Critters. This is our weekly live stream, um, usually every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, as long as I'm not traveling. And um, yeah, my travel schedule is getting pretty filled. And we're booking into 2021. So thank you, everybody, for your support. Good morning. Um, let's see. Morning, everybody. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We are an international educational center where we teach people all over the world how to empower the lives of themselves and their animals through positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. Good morning, Julie, Andrew, Kara, Tim, Jim. Mary, hey everybody. Um, Andrew, happy Sunday. Yes, it is gorgeous here in Northwest Ohio. 70 degrees. Um, yesterday I was out in my t-shirt, flip-flops, all day. Yeah. Um, so it's been a very rough winter here for us. Rough as far as we've had ice storms, wind storms, <laughs> serious negative degree temps. I love winter. I love snow, I should say. I love snow. Um, I don't mind colder temps, but um, that means 25 degrees and above. <laughs> but this is nice. We have our whole center open. We've got the windows open. We have the roofs open, and the animals are loving it. And we're good at getting prepared for all of the things coming up this summer. And we have quite a bit scheduled right here um, at the center. Um, we have... We're starting a nonprofit in Sam's name, um, and that's fabulous. And I want to give a huge shout out to um, the board of directors, all of our supporters, our attorney, our CPA, our banker, who are pushing this and moving it through fast. And I want to have our first fundraiser um, <clears throat> this summer. I will tell you more about it as it gets going, uh, but we're, we're coming in with a bang. Um, so good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. We have a lot lined up for you today. Um, sitting out here with all the birds and two of the pups. So for anybody, before I get started, you can find out more about uh, what we do here at the Animal Behavior Center on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. You can see our current events happening, uh, where I'll be speaking and presenting throughout the years. Um, and we have, just keep an eye on it. We got a lot going on. And if you ever need to get in, to in touch with me, I answer all my emails myself. Um, you can find me at Laura, L-A-R-A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. I had a few family emergencies going on over the weekend, and um, so we're getting back on track from that. So let's get started. What's going on with the commercial, Tim? Gosh, I know. <gasps> they told me March, and um, they have agreed to come on here and do a Coffee with Critters. That is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> you guys are going to want to watch this because we had a lot of fun with the production company um, and with the company that hired Rocky to come in and be on the commercial. Um, they're now saying May. They just told me that the other day, and I was like, no, you guys are going to kill me if I keep you hanging. <laughs> Oh, Daphne says, got my plane ticket, hotel, and car ready for October. Yes. Daphne, I will finally get to meet you face-to-face. -face. Hang on. I grab, grab my cup of coffee. I will finally get to meet you face-to-face. -face. Daphne has been on a – what's up, Rico? Rico's like still not digging the glasses. Um, Daphne has been on here as a guest with Coffee with the Critters. Very knowledgeable. Love your brain, Daphne. Can't wait to meet you. Today, we're joined by Milo, because poor sweet Milo, <laughs> he always gets stuck in the back. <laughs> um, yes, yes, yes. Oh, Julie says, anticipation is a harsh mistr mistress. <laughs> Sorry. I have you guys in anticipation of a couple of things. So we have reached out. Um... 
to help another animal in need. This is an animal that has been um, in the back of my mind. I will tell you more information, and I'm not trying to leave you guys hanging on this. It's just that some more questions need to be answered before um, this is done. When I bring an animal here for training, it's a huge commitment. I need to make sure I have the time, um, and I don't want to show an animal a way of life that cannot be continued. Um, that is something I battle with mentally myself quite a bit brings on a lot of stress and anxiety for me <laughs> um, it's going to require a very long road trip that's probably going to take me a flight out in a couple days hotel night on the way home so tim asked how is murray doing i am going to tell you tim all right so let's go ahead Next screenshot. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to let you guys know that um, pay attention to the Animal Behavior Center's website, the animalbehaviorcenter.com. We will list all of our events happening there. And also, you will find them here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page under events um, for everything coming up. Uh, I need to update that because I've been away from my computer for two days. Hey, Melissa. Uh, Melissa says, came in late. Are there still tickets for the October event? Yes, there are still tickets. Um, Melissa, yeah, and you can find that and reserve your spot at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Go to events. This one is going to sell out. I have no doubt. That's where uh, Deb Jones and myself will be presenting together for the second workshop in a row. Um, I do plan on having some other workshops here, but I'm planning in the next year, so stay tuned. And some are not going to be what you expect them to be. Um, in our Level 2 membership, uh, I think we've had a couple people join this past week. Um, this is, that is so pretty, Rocky. One of our several, most of our business here at the Animal Behavior Center is focused on live streaming our training behavior modification plans, uh, Q and A's, enrichment, all that stuff. Level two is more for people who are real serious um, about animal behavior training and enrichment through using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. We are having a book review right now, which is just blowing my mind. Um, we're talking about genetics, the impact of genetics on behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Chucklehead Festival has begun. <laughs> yeah, that is Rocky, our 20 year old Moluccan cockatoo. We made some big changes here at the center. This used to be um, where we'd keep any zoo animal that came in. It is now Rocky's enclosure. We decided to bring him closer to all the activity at the front. <laughs> Woo! What's the reinforcer, guys? <laughs> Rocky, you're killing me. What's the reinforcer? It's like a Greek chorus. Um, what's that behavior of laughing maintained indefinitely is increasing? What are you doing? Reinforcers are so much more than food, guys. So much more than food, as you can see. Um, <laughs> Mary says me and Mary I will ask you and this is what I do in the projects and the memberships our online services be more specific Tim says your attention and Tim I'm going to ask you be more specific we 
peekaboo. Julie nailed one of them. Laughing back at you is the re me laughing back at him is a reinforcer. Morning, Kimberly. <laughs> Bailey says you're laughing. Yes. And there's something, there's two more at least. I think. <laughs> Rocky. So one is laughing. <laughs> hey, Bobby. Yes, we've got laughing. Did you see me do anything else? Eye contact is another one. You got it, Bobby. <laughs> Peekaboo yourself. The other one was, did you see me lean in? I'm seeing you. I see you. Rocky clearly likes eye contact because he will move his head between the cage bars to get a clear view of my eyes. So that's how I've identified, bam, eye contact. Carol says saying his name, exactly. Um, all of those could be reinforcers. That behavior maintained or increased, so it was being reinforced. It was added, so it was positively reinforced. And um, positive reinforcers, be careful with those because they're called positive because they're added, all right? Positive reinforcers are always something of high value to the animal. You also have something, you also have something called a positive punisher. Uh, pu punishers are punishers because they happen after the behavior and it causes the future rate of the behavior to decrease. And they're positive because they're added. And whatever's added is always an aversive, okay? Positive punishers are aversives. Those are things we try to stay far away from here. We like to pair ourselves with positive reinforcers and we will use negative punishment, temporary timeout from positive reinforcement. You guys see how I use that in my live stream training in the memberships and the projects, which you can find on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. And I'm here to tell you they are skyrocketing. They are skyrocketing. And I wanna thank you guys also very much for your support. Um, I just uploaded a podcast, I believe it was Friday or Saturday, podcast. When I offer a podcast here from the Animal Behavior Center, it's only to people who are members of level one or level two. Those are things you can listen to while you're learning. We have a long, a very big library of them. They are meant for you to listen to while you're exercising, which never happens here, <laughs> um, at least not with me. So while you're cleaning, while you're driving, while you're doing whatever you're doing, doing the dishes, um, while you're getting ready in the morning, yes. Adrian says something the animal will work to get is a positive reinforcer, correct. And there's so much more than food, right, Adrian? Hi, right there. Um, all right, so Dr. Jessica Heckman, we're, this is what we're talking about in level two, about the effect, the role of genetics and behavior, um, domestication, evolution of domestication, uh, domestication and behavior versus the undomesticated, and it's pretty cool. Dr. Jessica Heckman is coming on with us. She's um, a geneticist and so much more than I even know what she is. Um, she's been to the Fox Farms in Russia and where they have um, a huge study on genetics and the evolution of genetics, or evolution of domestication. Okay, so she's coming on with us next week in the Parrot Project. We have um, an interview coming on this week. We have a Q&A in level one this week because I had to reschedule yesterday. Um, we'll have a Q&A in the Pig Project. But also, I was recently asked to come to Long Island Mm -hmm. for the C4AW uh, collaboration for avian wellness on June 8th and 9th. It'll be for a weekend. Uh, there'll be several of us out there and you can find out more about information about this on their website, c4aw.org. If you are an agriculturist, a bird lover, um, taking care of birds, loving birds, conservation, C4AW is a must on your list. Um, okay, 
you heard me talk about the projects. We have deaf dog project, parrot project, pig project, snow project, all right? Um, let's see, there's something I've been wanting to mention that I keep forgetting. And it's not that I forget, it. it's not that I'm forgetting, and Tim, this is for you. Um, it's not that I keep forgetting, it's that the whole picture would not post here. So here it is. We've had some big changes here at the center. Some very rough, mm -hmm. um, but new beginnings come from anything rough, right? Um, Kimberly says, "Will you?" Hi, Rico. Will you be doing a talk as well with Coffee with Critters? Yeah, when I'm in Long Island, we're gonna have a special episode of Coffee with the Critters. Absolutely, great question, Kim, and thank you. Um, Oh, no, we're supposed to be racing that weekend, Melissa. Melissa's who I uh, I sail on her crew in the summer. I'm going to have to miss that weekend, Melissa. I'm sorry. I didn't know that was the weekend. Um, yeah, Indonesian Parrot Project needs help. I was just on the phone the other day with the executive director, Bonnie Zimmerman, and she was sending me messages last night. I will be getting together with Bonnie Zimmerman fairly soon. We're talking about it. Like I said, stay tuned to the events. <laughs> hey, Lori. Um, okay. Um, all right. So one of the things we, we did make an announcement about, but it kind of got lost in everything with, hey, sweetheart, here with Levi, our deaf dog, it got lost in the mix of things happening. <laughs> what is so funny? Murray, our green wing macaw, who will be 15 years old next month, has been rehomed. Hi, Rico. Um, and I'm the one that drove him. This is Kendall Jukala. She is a um, she is a volunteer here. We rehomed Murray with. <laughs> two days after Sam passed. Murray's rehoming has been planned, and it's something I've thought about for years. Okay, so we rehomed Murray. Um, and I'm sitting here looking at the dynamics of how the center is being shaped and changed over the years. Um, Murray. Peek -a -boo, boo boo Rock needs to be in somebody's home. He was not happy out here. I wanted to rehome Murray probably about nine years ago. Because we took him in because he was supposed to go into somebody's house. We took him in for training and he was supposed to go down to Kansas. They backed out. Murray has just lived here. Um, and it's. I told people here, him just staying in a cage by himself, not okay. I'm not okay with that. Um, I don't mind having him stay here as long as people can pick him up, get him out, move him around. Um, that wasn't happening. Um, so I tried to increase enrichment. It still had room for improvement. Um, so I just made the announcement, Murray has to go into somebody's home. You open up the dictionary and find the definition of a perfect bird, you're going to see Murray's picture sitting right there. And um, Kendall's been a volunteer here at the Animal Behavior Center for a year and a half. He is thriving, you guys. She's sending me photos and videos. He is thriving. Right, Rock? 
he's doing much better in a home than he was here. And maybe we have another episode, upcoming episode on rehoming. I am not against rehoming animals. We've done it a couple of times here. Any animal here? I am not selfish enough to keep an animal here because I love it. All right? If an animal here is not thriving, it needs to go where somebody can help it thrive. Um, and if you can prove to me that you can give better to an animal than what I'm giving it here, I will seriously consider it. But you're going to really have to fight me for several. <laughs> uh, but Kendall and her husband, Trevor, send me photos and videos at least weekly. And it is, it is so cool to see. And he doesn't have a cage. You know what he has? His home is like a big play gym, like the one above my head. So he lives cage free. All right. So um, let's see. What else did I need to talk about before we take a question? Nothing. All right. One last thing. Did you guys know? Do you guys know what contra freeloading is? Hey, Shelly. Hey, Anna. Um, hey, there's the awesome Nancy Forrester. Um, you guys know what contra freeloading is? We're big here on contra freeloading. Um, I have several presentations I've given on contra freeloading. A lot of times people will get contra freeloading and foraging mixed up, confused. Um, contra freeloading does involve foraging. And what it is is when the animal prefers to work for food and passes up exact identical free food at less effort and chooses to work for it instead. Um, there's several different theories out there why it happens. <laughs> tickle, 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 Rocky. Rocky Joseph. Anyways, um, a lot of people think that just foraging is contra freeloading. Foraging is the act of searching for food. Um, in order for it to be contra freeloading, say you have... So you have a piece of kibble and it's sitting in a dish and you have another piece of kibble, but it's wrapped in a paper cone cup, stuck in a box. Uh, just there, Okay. If the animal passes the one that is in the dish and goes for the one that's in the box and actually ingests the food, you have to ingest the food. Then that is contra freeloading. The dog or the animal or whatever has passed up this free food at less effort. The exact same size, the exact same freshness. The one in the box cannot be soaked. Otherwise, it's not identical. Tickle, tickle, tickle. It's called contra freeloading. Are you guys on your computer? Because Google it. If you Google it, you know what you'll find? My pig underneath the definition of, underneath uh, Wikipedia's definition of contra freeloading. Uh, who was it? Was it Sharon that told me that? I can't remember, Sharon Collins. She said, do you know if you Google contra freeloading, your, your, your center shows up um, in my life. Yes. What in the world? Rocky. I just added one more reinforcer. In addition to the eye contact, in addition to the talking, in addition to the the S and disc, I put the emphasis on my communication. <laughs> oh no! It was Pat. That thanks, Pat. It was Pat that said that. She said it was me. There's the awesome Dr. Patricia Anderson, anthropologist, anthropologist. Pat, I'm going to be getting in touch with you this week. Talk about an amazing mind, that woman right there. Um, yeah, so that was pretty cool. So, yeah, contra freeloading. A lot of people misunderstand it. Let me give you another example, okay? When I show my presentation on contra freeloading, I have three different ones. One of the animals that's in there is Willie, our turkey vulture. No, she's not our turkey vulture. She's nature's nursery's turkey vulture. She's just here for training. 
Um, I show, okay, Willie eats mice. So I show, they already expired. I show a video of a mouse. Okay, Willie had this stump that was about this big that used to, um, was a conditioned reinforcer. I paired it with her delivery of food. I had a, a little black mouse sitting right there from the same batch of mice, all right? Um, and I took another little black mouse, same size, same freshness, as best as I could tell, from the same batch. I stuck it in a paper cone cup, twisted it shut, stuck it in a box, closed it, and sat them both on the stump. And it shows her, she goes over and she looks at the little black mouse sitting there, and she goes over to the box and starts ripping it apart. She rips apart the box. She grabs the paper cone cup, and she already knew this, that that box and that paper cone cup are conditioned reinforcers. They're paired with the delivery of food, so she knew that the food was in there. But I think she did based on the behavior she gave. So she ripped that apart, and then she rips open the paper cone cup, and that's when I stopped that's when I stopped the video because of what comes next <laughs> because she ended up eating the mouse in the cup. But my question is, is that contra free loading? If the animal, if Willie did not eat the mouse and just shredded all that paper, you know what that's called? That's called enrichment. That is not contra free loading and that is not foraging. That's called enrichment and enrichment identified. That's when you should say, these types of enrichment, as long as they're not causing behavior issues, should be um, incorporated into this animal's daily activity. Hey, Juzwan, how are you? I see you comment on my post a lot. Um, <laughs> Nancy says, I'm on Wikipedia, Contra Freeloading, illustrated by Laura Joseph. Way to go. Thanks. And thanks, Pat, for letting me know because I may not have never, ever known it. Um, you are very welcome, Pat. Okay, she, Pat says she was updating a lecture and was so excited to see Milo when I Googled country freeloading. <laughs> um, there's several factors. Gosh, am I going into a coffee with the critters on country freeloading? There's several factors that determine country freeloading. Okay. The hungrier the animal is, the more likely it's going to go for the free food. Um, once it gets to about... 50% satiated, they tend to, and there's many factors on this, they tend to go and start working for their food. Why? Why? Mental stimulation? Because, it, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, studies also show that animals in our care, it specifically says in, um, in enclosures, um, are seriously lacking in problem solving, problem solving situations. That's us guys. That study shows that we, our animals are not mentally and physically engaged enough in problem solving skills. There's also another talk I give saying work is not a four letter word. I need my animals working. I want them working. We get out here every day and we work. And I'll tell you what, even that's why I train because it empowers the animal using positive reinforcement. Because yesterday, I got some of the animals out there in the center and just a couple of hours of on and off, different exposure to Okay, I'll take it. We're not laughing anymore. <laughs> just a couple of hours out there training and just sitting in the sunshine, um, engaging through different activities. These guys were wiped out, dogs included, pig included. I did something different for the pig. Every... And another thing is, the animal is always the one that determines the reinforcer. It is not us. The animal is also the one that determines the punisher. It is not us. It's up to us to be able to identify them um, 
and how to accurately use them. Exactly, Melinda. We all need stimulation and challenge. Think of all the activities you go through in a day. And if I ever come to the conclusion that I'm bored, <laughs> that is one word you will next to never hear come out of my mouth. I am bored. Uh, because I'm so busy doing a lot of different things. Would your animal say the same thing? Because your animal say, if you look over at your animal right now, sitting there, laying there, perching there, whatever, could you honestly answer what they would, what they would respond with if you asked them if they were bored? Rico, not the right time to be chiming in. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I think that was it in the pictures. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So today is a Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? I will do my best to answer. And when the Coffee with the Critters is open, uh, ended, what I do is I grab my computer, go back in my office and sit and work. I got several days of emails to catch up on, but I review the Coffee with the Critters, and I go back and answer things that I didn't have answer, time to answer on the live stream. Oh, wow, you guys are making a lot more comments and I didn't see them. Um, Rico is, Ann says Rico's kind of quiet. Yeah, that's a good thing. Let's, let's, let's leave it at that. How is Suki doing? Where is she? Lost my bird. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's on her station. Hi. Right, there's the Sukesters. Okay. The more I don't train, the more behavior issues I get. Suki is not used to my glasses. Break this week. So. Suki and Coco, well, Suki's very bonded to Coco. She doesn't want. So we're going to be talking about this in the parrot project, over bonding, right? Um, that's a, a common issue. Most people, a lot of people don't know what it looks like. Suki is extremely bonded to Coco. If you go in Coco's cage, Suki will so, show signs of stress. And... You're going to get nailed the next time you walk in Suki's cage. Okay. Um, Nancy asked, what did I do differently with Milo yesterday? Milo, what was that? Hi. 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 What did I do different with Milo yesterday? Um, I need to keep the do dogs, I need to keep the mammals off the grass in the center because we're getting it prepared for a workshop coming up in a couple weeks and um, just getting the grass looking nice and well. What I did different with Milo yesterday, because it was 70 degrees here, and I talked about this in the podcast the other day, Nancy. <clears throat> in stagnant environments, you will see behavior issues explode. The more intelligent the animal, the more likely the behavior issues, okay? Um, and an, an animal is intelligent as intelligent needs, as it needs to be. And an animal, it, then you get in the whole, defi what is the definition of intelligence? <laughs> Look that one up. You'll see a million different ones. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but I'll pass. Um, one that I like very much um, I read in one of Bern Heinrich's um, books, and I believe it was a, doesn't matter, um, that I really liked the way he defined intelligence, which was um, each time an animal engages in a situation where it starts manipulating 
the event, the situation to get a different consequence. I was like, oh yeah, a consequence that is desired by the animal. For example, I talked about this. <laughs> you wanna see an amazing animal, an amazing mind, watch the crow, watch the crow. And they're called pests along with pigeons and rats because they quickly outwit us and squirrels. Okay, I see that happen. I was like, oh, wow, you're just teaching that animal how to forage even better. <laughs> um, all right, so here's something I said at my, I think this was at my workshop in Montreal. Um, the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep. <laughs> there you go. That would be the pig. What we did with Milo yesterday is we sectioned off an area in the backyard behind the center. Um, new area. We don't like, we see that the more that Milo just stays in the training room, the more behavior issues develop. Um, same thing with our dogs. So now that it's getting warmer, we've got the backyard, we've got the center, we've got certain parts of the center, we've got behind the center. I was just thinking about yesterday, making another part back here. We're thinking about putting aviaries right outside these windows um, this summer that I'm getting ready to build in the parrot project uh, just to give get, get these guys moving different rooms we hang, hung a huge branch in the training center so we can move birds into that room um, just keep them moving just keep them moving all right that's what we do here in cages we take this bird and put it in this cage. We put that bird and stick it in that cage. Um, different sites, different views. We take the animals, the mammals. Sometimes Snow's in the house right now. She's usually not out here with the coffee with the critters because I have to watch her. I have to constantly watch her um, because this can be a dangerous place for her to be. She cannot see. She cannot hear. But she adapts very well. She knows when there's a pig on the other side of the door or when there's a turkey vulture on the other side of the door. She can smell it. <clears throat> but one of the examples I gave in Montreal was um, I sat there and I was like, is this a behavior issue starting to arise? Remember when we had that cage there, the one that Sam used to go to school on? Um, we used to keep the dogs. Sometimes we keep the pig in there. But when we have a zoo animal in here, we'll put it in that cage. Well, it's not back. It's now back there in the back um we had the crow in there chronos the crow and i was sitting there watching i was like why is he going to the floor so much and i sat there and watched because i needed to identify reinforcers in here um we had a crow to make sure that because i was thinking about getting a raven as a permanent resident here and i told everybody i was just like, like oh yeah it'd be so cool and i was like so cool for you because me, I see a 10,000 square foot center that would slowly be taken apart piece by piece by a very bored raven. I need to make sure. <laughs> that would probably be one of the most complex, intelligent minds I have ever worked with. So um, we brought in a crow and we trained a crow here for what, six months and the crow went back to the zoo. Hence the reason we still don't have a raven. But what he was doing was he would take, we fed him a lot of different stuff. He would take pieces of kibble, fly to the bottom of the cage, crows have long beaks, and he would, what is that Rocky Joseph? He would take that piece of kibble and stick it underneath the cage and push it out past the cage bars to lure the dogs and the pig in. Once the dogs and the pig would come close, so he was creating his own enrichment. Once the pigs and the dog would come close, not at the same time, he would hurry up and grab that piece of food and try to stab the mammal through the cage bars. Not a good thing to be happening. And I was just like, you clever little devil. <laughs> Get your butt off the floor. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, <clears throat> extinction burst probably, hi, 
Where? What? You want to do a somersault? You want to do a somersault? You want to show off for coffee with the critters? He's like, crows aren't the most intelligent. Show us, Rico. Show us. You want to do a somersault? Levi's like, show me. And Quincy. They're like, can we train today? Can we train on coffee with the critters? What questions do you have? Uh, okay, so let's take Pam's. Getting ready to change cages for my gray. Anything I can do to make the change more comfortable for her. Same purses, toys, etc. She's a picker and hoping it doesn't get her too stressed. Okay, so this is going to be a bird question. And just because it's a bird question, mammal people do not tune out because it's not necessarily about the animal what I'm going to be addressing. I'm going to be, I'm going to help Pam give her suggestions for a behavior change plan through shaping, which is reinforcing small approximations towards the desired behavior, All right? This is a shaping process. This is a lot of what we do here is shaping. Almost everything involves shaping, okay? We are who we are today because we are a product of our environment through through shaping, through consequences of what life has delivered to me over the past 48 years. I am who I am through 48 years of shaping, the environment shaping me. Okay? So, Pam, what? Joseph, what are you doing? I'm just trying to keep the pace here for another 20 minutes. All right. So, Pam, this is a shaping question. <laughs> um, you hear me say, <laughs> I'm reinforcing. Levi targeting his nose to my thigh. You always hear me say, keep your animal used to change. This is why we, come on up, folks. This is why we don't like stagnant environments here. Stagnant environments can create stress when the environment has to change. All right? I see that a lot with animals. All right? So I would, ouch, Levi. I was trying to get my... <laughs> I think that behavior just punished itself. <laughs> we might just grab my leg and clawed on it, uh, put his foot on it, and it hurt. And then I was like, ouch. And then he can't hear me. But Quincy just went over and went right on his head. Um, okay, this is a shaping question. I would, without knowing more about, thanks, my shirt is no longer clean. With not, not knowing more about your individual situation, what I would do is, uh, put the two cages next to each other and maybe put some of the favored toys in the other cage. And now, Pam, I'm just going off of what I don't know. All right. Um, because <clears throat> a lot of people don't know what's good thing. I just washed these jeans. A lot of people don't know what stress looks like. Um, uh, feathered destructive behaviors. If it is not a medical condition, it is likely a behavior issue um, and stress. Um, two biggest steps in our shaping plans. I would introduce the cage at a distance where the animal is calm. We're going to have a future coffee with the critters on overstimulation. I just wrote that out today. Um, where the animal is calm, reinforce. Don't deprive in its cage now, but I would put some of its favorite toys in the other cage. Um, reinforce with toys, attention, treats, tactile, touching. Um, and let see if you can let the animal decide and go start going over on its own. But when it does, reinforce heavily. Okay? Um, make sense? And says, my neighbor's dog has severe separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is... Some people, I mean, we have a couple of cases of separation anxiety here. It's not that it's hard. It's that it's detailed. It's individualized. It's specific. And it needs to be consistent. And the hard part is people have a hard time being consistent. 
Um, when I'm dealing with a separation anxiety case, uh, one thing I always have is a camera to watch and I'm listening, all right? And those separation anxiety cases here, um, separation anxiety cases here, depends. We have some severe ones, looking right at it. Um, and we have some more mild ones where we can cue, and try not to do this, but a lot of times with separation anxiety, we unknowingly cue stress getting ready to happen because the separation is getting ready to happen. So then you start to see it blow up all over the place. Um, and that's my concern with a lot of different animals. I think, if we're going to be adopting out animals, I really think a lot of um, adoption processes need to be a little more thorough because when we adopt out, whether it's parrot, dog, whatever, pig, um, when we adopt out, a lot of times I don't think some shelters know even what they're looking at and dealing with and then we place that animal in a home and then it just skyrockets a lot of times true behavior starts showing there and the person in the home is trying to do what they think is right by adopting and then they end up taking on a case such as severe separation anxiety uh, fear fear and fear um, because of moving too fast and then it sets everybody up for failure that animal gets returned if it's a separation anxiety case that will often reinforce the separation anxiety and it positive it can positively punish the behavior of that person wanting to rescue again and we do both we do both here we rescue and there's animals here we have purchased there's animal there's like I have some dream animals that I really want but I have not gotten because I feel selfish for going and getting them because there's so many that need help. And I can help so many by showing the processes of how to counter condition. And I need to change my mindset on that. Um, because if I were to go out, you know, um, I had a talk recently with a very dear friend about this and she's like, yeah, but you know, you shouldn't think that way because so many people could learn from you from getting a young animal and showing all the steps to do to get it to the point where it needs to be to live a happy, thriving, successful life. So I will reconsider that. All right. Um, so let's take, good morning, Kim. Um, and says it howls for hours with separation anxiety, and that is very sad. Um, maybe find, very sad for the animal, and do the owners even understand that that is what they're looking at? Um, uh, uh, my approach there would be, don't tell them what not to do. Just ask them, and this is what I do. Ask them, are these the behaviors you're seeing? Yes, yes, you, and then you'll see, a lot of times you'll see a person say yes, and I just don't know what to do. Then you can offer information. People learn faster from being reinforced for what to do versus what told not to do. Um, Kathy Kitt says, I have a deaf border collie who has become fearful inside our RV. We are full-time RVers working on counter conditioning, but hard to pinpoint exactly what caused the issue. So having some difficulty getting her to relax. Any suggestions? Kathy, that is great. Trying to keep him laughing and not screaming. <laughs> okay. Identify the reinforcer behind why the fear is starting. So Kathy, you already know it's paired with the RV. It's something inside the RV. The dog cannot hear. So it is probably something it's seeing or something it's feeling. Okay. Um, and it's probably a couple of things that are coming to mind, Kathy. One could be with without doing a full-blown consult and knowing all the details. 
a couple of things could have happened. Something was paired, something visually or something it felt was paired, and this would have been aversive, something inside the RV that the dog was not familiar with, and you can, that's called a positive punisher and an, or an aversive, and you can pair one aversive with a behavior, and it can be so severe that it positively punishes all future rate of behavior. Not that counter conditioning can't work. It just may take you a lot longer. Um, be observant. This is what I would do, Kathy. Next time you ask your uh, dog to come into the RV, watch its behavior. Just sit there and watch. Where do the signs of stress start happening? Like the panting, the lip licking, uh, watch all its body behavior. Where do you first start seeing signs of stress? When it's looking at something in the kitchen, when it's going further back into the RV, because that's when you're going to start identifying where you need to begin. Um, and this is what we talked about yesterday in the podcast. Shape calm or reinforce calm. When you're not sure, just start reinforcing any type of calm behavior. And that could be through treats or that could be through tactile information. Like with my dog, watch my death dog. I'm reading behavior, okay? He's sleeping at my feet. Let's just take him over here. It's so quiet, I hate this. What are you doing? So I'm reading behavior. All I'm doing is reading me. Okay? I can show you where I can get stressful behavior here, nervous behavior. He doesn't like large objects going over his head. So what's your thing? Right there, Kathy. I'm reinforcing with tactile interaction, tactile attention. All right, and my hands going up. <laughs> my hands going up like this. This means yay! It's happy time. Let's party. All right. So let's work on. I guarantee you. So many times we take too big a steps in our shaping plan. Here's something I have to be careful of. This is my tripod that I live stream from. If I were to, I'm gonna start training. If I were to pick this up over his head, I would see lip licking, ears drop, head drop, and he moves away. All right. So this is what we talked about yesterday in our podcast. Where should we start with this? Tickle, wickle. Where could we start with this, moving this over his head? And this is what we're talking about in the parrot project right now, too. Is maybe we don't start with this, okay? Maybe we start with something that he's already okay with, like this. Think about yourself. Butter and squash from birds. Hope you guys can see this. Okay. Birds we just took out to clean. Okay, 
this is going to take me some time to get this down. Um, but what I would do, these legs, sorry, he's still washing my hands, so I'm still training. This behavior just told me. These legs short enough, what I would do, make this as small as possible, raise, bridge, reinforce, then start going over their head. And all I'm trying to do is put my tripod away, <laughs> but I'm paying attention. <laughs> All right. Um, that's what I would do, Kathy. I would start paying attention and then train them. Um, I would start. I would start. Um, did you hear me say all I'm trying to do is put my tripod away? Did you notice that I did not lift it over his head? I moved it down low like this. Um, so many people have, would have thought the training session would have been over and I was trying to end it, but I wanted to put my tripod away. So I pay attention every single time I pick up that tripod. I'm like, where is Levi? And how am I going to pick this up? So, um, that's why I train Kathy training using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis builds confidence and that is the only reason I train I, that and the fact that so many people want to know how to do better so that is what I do you are very welcome he just came up and put his head on my lap yep you're welcome when I want my relationship with Levi my death dog to skyrocket I train him in a lot of it's this and he, I see a totally different dog come on okay um New behavior from Coco, Eva says, drawing his beak across the cage wires to make, make noticeable noise. Um, is it getting your attention, Eva? If it is, that's probably why he's doing it. And that would be my first thing I would suspect. If not, it could be lack of, and this, is, this happens here too, um, it could be lack of desirable enrichment. I would take maybe something else in their environment and make it more desirable. When you start seeing things like this, Eva, drawing his beak across the cage wires to make noticeable noises, a lot of times I'll see that turn into an abnormal repetitive behavior. So be careful with that one. And I would redirect that one immediately and I would start with foraging um, or increase your training. Yep. Eva says, yep, the attention is the reason for it. Um, Um, so be careful. All right. But I think, okay, Lynn says dog can't hear. Then he feels the rumbling of the RV. Yeah, we had to shape. I had to shape the behavior of Quincy, our Rottweiler, going when we, when my mom and dad purchased her for me when she was a couple months old, three months old, I think. But Quincy had been coming here for training since she was five weeks old. Okay. And a lot of that was just exposure to different sounds uh, because that was a quality breeder. Um, anyways, um, I could clearly tell by Quincy's behavior, she was not comfortable going into a car. She loved going on the leash because I watched her body like, yee, 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 yee. we're going for a walk. As we would approach the car, she would just stop. She would put on the brakes and she wouldn't go any further. So I had to shape all of that. I had to shape. We're walking past the Jeep. We're going to walk past the Jeep again. We're going to walk by again. I'm going to put my hand on the door handle. And I'm going to, in all this, I'm bridging and reinforcing. And then I started in the training room. We're going to go up and down a ramp onto a table. Hey, Sandy. Um, we're going to go up and down a ramp onto a table. And because that ramp is eventually going to go into the back of the car, then we're going to. <clears throat> um, I had to. Sh then I had to pair shape 
going up into the car on the ramp, but the car didn't turn on. That was two biggest steps. I would have taken two biggest steps into the car. Off the and um, then it was in the car, turn the car on, turn the car off, bridge reinforce, out, end of training session. Um, so then I was, I was paying close attention to, is she anticipating the end of the training session? Because if she is, you are not, you are probably using, neck. You, you, you're, you're still using, you could be still using positive reinforcement, but negative reinforcement is now pushing this way in. And that is one we want to stay as far away from, just like the positive reinforcer. Negative reinforcement is when the animal gives you the behavior to escape or avoid the consequence. Just get the training session over. I don't want to see that. Okay. All right, guys. Well, it looks like that's the end of the coffee with the critters. Shoot me an email. Type right here because I am going to keep, I'm going to go in and review this. What topics you want to see. I have a ton of topics, but I also want to help you guys. Um, but if you want more information um, and more detailed work individualized to you, that's what our uh, projects are for. We have the pig project, deaf dog project, snow project, pig project. Those are species specific. Then we have, this is all live streaming. We do this and it's not the importance. It's not in watching the live stream. It's watching everything unedited, unedited training, monthly Q and A's even if you're not there. Um, level one is for companion animals. Level two is more for people who want more, and a lot of professionals are in there as well. Uh, let's see. I think I, yeah, I knew that was going to be in there. Uh, in three weeks from yesterday, we are having a pet tutor workshop here where Wes and Amanda will be here along with, they're bringing two professional dog trainers, and I will be here as well. To, it's, it's a workshop from 1 to 4 or 1 to 5. I believe it's from 1 to 5 in the afternoon on April 27th. That is $15 per person here at the center. You will see training, engagement, and possibly you getting up and interacting in some of the training. We're going to have dogs, pigs, and possibly even a pigeon. Um, those $15 per person. If you are in level 1 and level 2, it will be live streamed for you at no charge. Um, second weekend in October, Dr. Deb Jones and I will be giving our second workshop together, all species animal behavior and training workshop. Save your seat because they're already selling. They've been selling. Um, and I have no doubt it'll sell out. Uh, don't forget, uh, I am honored to have been asked to be a part of the Collaborating for Avian Wellness, C4AW.org. Um, and... I will speak, be speaking at the their event. I believe it's in Long Island on June 8th and 9th. If you're not signed up to receive our uh, emails, one just went out Saturday morning. I'm trying to get more regular about it, but you can do that. It's here on our Facebook page. All right, so I will see you next weekend. Um, hey, Susie, it was so good to see you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And if you need to get in touch with us, you can reach us on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. And you can always reach me at my email personally, Laura, at the Animal Behavior Center. All right. When in Mexico? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I have been to Mexico, but not necessarily speaking there. But it was on a cruise that went through Cancun. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, haven't had anybody from Mexico ask me. But... You never know. All right. I will see you guys next weekend.